And I was sitting in the back room and I could hear what was going on on the stage. And what happened then was they gave the Entrepreneur of the, the Year Award. And it was to a guy who was selling franchises for portable fire extinguishers, okay? And what had happened prior to that event was that I had a call from somebody asking me, he was contemplating buying one of these franchises. And he said, is there any chance we're going to regulate halons? And I said, absolutely. You see, the halons are 30 times, 32 times more destructive than chlorofluorocarbons. And the reason why they're not regulated right now was just CFCs at that point in time was because of the volumes that were much smaller. So they called me up on stage and said, well, why are you destroying this guy's business, his future, his career? And I said, I'm not, I have a duty to inform the public what's technically relevant and known about this. Then he instituted a lawsuit against me. Okay, multi-million dollar lawsuit. That lawsuit hung in the wind till the year before I retired from government. That was multi-million dollars because the Department of Justice had notified me many times saying they, didn't, they weren't quite sure whether they could defend me or not because did I exceed my rights as a civil servant or not? And so anyway, I was at, in 92, was this still hanging over my head. I was at the Earth Summit in Brazil and I talked to Paul Martin, John Turner, and a number of others. I explained my dilemma and they said, well, if it comes to a court case, we're gonna raise it in the House of Commons. Just a little aside. So I was head of the delegation and chief negotiator of Canada from the Vienna Convention until the creation of the Montreal Protocol. I was also a special advisor to Dr. Mustafa Tolba, who was UNEP head. He would ask me to come down to Nairobi a day or two before official meetings start, and we walk around the grounds at the headquarters and basically discuss what are you going to do with the opposition groups. Some of those are a group of 77 and a number of others. So I and Dr. Chisholm developed and proposed a priority setting concept, which was auto the utilization of measuring ozone depleting substance to context of the tonnage that's produced times its uh, you have cut out again right okay i was head of the delegation canadian delegation chief negotiator for canada from the vienna convention up, which was 1985, up until the signing of the Montreal Protocol in 1987. I was also a special advisor to Dr. Tolba. And what that consisted of during this developmental stage is that he would ask me to come to Nairobi earlier than any meetings that we were having down there and walk around the gardens and discuss strategies for how we're going to deal with the opposition groups, how best to deal with it. And again, I mentioned that Dr. Alex Chisholm and I together developed and proposed a priority setting com concept for ozone depleting substances. And this was to characterize them as the tonnage times the ozone depleting potential. And this is what gave rise to dealing with CFCs first, rather than halons. We introduced also the idea of control based on production plus imports minus exports. Now, up until that time, the discussion had been largely about capacity. You only needed a treaty for countries that were producing. And there was only about 26 to 30 countries producing, and that wouldn't be a global treaty, yet everybody in the world was using CFCs for pr preservation of the food supply, refrigerators. Okay, so based on my experience with the London Dumping Convention, I offered the notion of a series of annexes called a basket approach, where people could have a choice and meet the requirements for ozone reduction in terms of consumption, but choose what works best for them. I proposed the entry into force for the treaty, which is a double trigger, and that was based on my work in the Marpole Convention, where it was a fraction of tonnage and a fraction of signature. So you could, you could make this happen in that way. In the context of the Montreal Protocol, what was interesting is that 86% of the CFCs were produced in the developed countries and they're a very small amount, okay? And the number of triggers was 
to enter into force, Montreal Protocol needed 11 ratifications and two thirds of global cons consumption of controlled substances. And I, again, I've covered that. Okay, there are many books in the history of the MP, mostly based on meeting final reports. That's what you'll see in Wikipedia, all of this stuff, just reiterations of what was the, the, the dusted up and cleaned off reports. There's also the undocumented history, which I intend to tell you a little bit about today. I've picked a few items I hope will stimulate interest in discussions. Many observations in my slides coming up are my own personal recollections that can only be corroborated or refuted by others who were there at the time of these occurrences. Okay, I will also allude to the bureaucrats dilemma, CFCs and the fear of career terminating comments. And an example of that was my experience on the TV show marketplace. If I'd said the wrong thing, I could have lost my job. Okay, now setting the vision for the Montreal Protocol. By 1983, the science had demonstrated the need to exercise the precautionary principle and it was now time to establish the vision for charting the pathway forward. Vision setting for environmental protection is the responsibility of government who alone are accountable for making these tough decisions in the overall best interest of everybody. Industry sets its own vision, but in the context of the corporation, not necessarily for the long-term public good. Industry nonetheless had and continues to have a very important contributing role to play in creating or destroying political will, at least in the short term for the Montreal Protocol. For the Montreal Protocol, vision setting did not come easily. Governments could not agree on the magnitude or imminence of the threat, and this hindered striking a public policy balance. And a notable case on that was uh, the position of the U.S. government at the time. For the U.S. government, the, the guy by the name of Holden, who was this, um, hang on, just I'm just referring, his name was Don Holden. He was a secretary of the interior with, to interior with Reagan. He, he started mouthing off saying, we don't need a treaty. We need sunscreen, broad rim hats, and sunglasses. And this was the message coming out of the you know, most industrialized country in the world at that time. So the industry produced researchers with credentials that denied the threat, just like climate change. Somebody said, no, I don't agree with this scientific, and, and they were paid people from industry. We had lots of example of those. I'm sure John will remember those. And now in terms of the atmospherics, at the time we were negotiating this treaty, many of the plenipotentiaries, those of the official, normally the heads of delegation, but the people that were designated to speak and commit on behalf of a government, okay? They were often, in this case, junior members of delegation, the environment people, with only limited influence. Most of the heads of delegations were not technical experts that time and were compelled to adhere to strict delegation instructions that left little room for compromise or negotiations. Hence, for the informal discussions, which I alluded to in the first slide about the friends of the protocol, okay? Industry was both part of delegations at that time and via the registered associations played a very influential role on delegations. And the classic example of that was the UK delegation, which was in strong opposition. And that, that was ICI, because in the background on ICI was that they were worried that they would destroy, it would destroy their export market. And it had a, a very substantial point percent of their production going to developing countries. And they thought they'd lose share to, to uh, DuPont and others that maybe already had in the wings, unknowing to many, substitutes. NGOs were not part of the national delegation in the early years. And I remember the head of the delegation from the UK telling me it's not an issue in the UK. It's just not there. And it's not ever going to be a treaty. And so what we did, we, we mustered friends of the earth here. We mustered in the sense that we briefed them, educated them, we asked them to contact their counterparts in the UK and help make this an issue. And they did that, as if people that are here know that experience well. 
key fear that was expressed was not the inability to adequately protect the ozone layer, but the potential for adverse economic ramifications in many countries. And this was the prevailing atmosphere in the meeting rooms leading up to negotiations of both the Vienna Convention and the Montreal Protocol. And it, basically the unspoken dynamic was the pursuit of peri, peri, parochial self-interest. Excuse me, guys. Okay, now the barriers in the run-up to the Vienna Convention. There was no need, as I alluded to earlier, to exercise the precautionary principle. There was no consensus on even a production capacity cap to limit the damage. There was a total preoccupation with the possible winners and losers. And the red herring that was introduced is, and it was really backed up by the World Trade Organization, environment cannot be allowed to be an artificial barrier to trade. And Mustafa told by the head of UNIP, asked me to go with him to the World Trade Organization and meet with the head to deal with this issue. And when he said, you know, it's, you can't do it. You can't create an environment regulation that turns into a barrier from trade. And I said, well, look, what's the reverse of that? You're using trade as a barrier to protect the environment. Where's the morality in that? Anyway, that's the side story. And there was conspiracy theories and strategic application of doubt. You know, one, as I said before, that there was this idea that DuPont already had hidden a substitute. And the whole exercise is about stealing market share. And the lack of public awareness of the science and the dimensions of the threat meant little political will could be generated. And it, the early efforts by a few, as I alluded to, the UK, and the precursor to the, the European Union, which is then known as the Re Regional Economic Integration Organization, and Mexico, who was led by later became a friend, Juan Antonio Mateos, he's ambassador from Mexico. He led the group of 77 to, and to prevent control measures against it. And you ask, why would he do that? Well, his worry was that the developing countries would lose access to these critical chemicals since they weren't any of the manufacturing sites for them. So the Toronto group was initiated to sustain the vision and create some momentum to move forward. And as I alluded to, we did STEMI engage Friends of the Earth to take friends of the, the earth in the UK and create public world, will in that work. Okay, and I just alluded already to what Mexico's problem was that could restrict their developing country access to these chemicals. India, okay, they were a little concerned for a different reason. They, they thought they were a producer too, not the biggest. But when, even when we signed the Montreal Protocol, India come on board and had on their delegation industry expert that said, India has no intention to sign this protocol. And so if you want a guaranteed long-term supply, you know, look to India, okay? Developed countries were worried, and they responded by observing what can't be done. Governments could encourage in some degree facilitate by removing barriers, but ultimately, the access to information would be the controlling feature, okay? Meaning government couldn't restrict this use. It was patents and everything else. And India's point at that time was that, well, well, you guys create laws, you can change them. But developed countries insisted in a free market, democratic company, countries, economies, this confiscation of property rights could not happen. We couldn't intercede in that way. Now, the Vienna Convention, unfortunately, I, I've quoted some of the text here, was a bicycle with no pedals. We couldn't agree on much of anything. We couldn't even agree on a control framework. Okay. All we could do, well, the only thing that came out good about that is we agreed to have agencies cooperate together to work together to find suitable alternatives. And at the close of the Vienna Convention, a resolution by Sweden, which they asked me to help craft, was a proposal creating a timetable to get people to commit to, to come back and adopt control measures, which ultimately resulted in the multilateral protocol. Okay? There was no consensus on the science, the health effects, the terrestrial effects. They all remained under debate. Okay? The growth rates were still debatable, the dimensions of the rising threat. 
The technological feasibility of phasing out restricting substitutes was questioned. Practicality of and economic impacts of mitigation measures, the affordability for developing countries, the nature and scope of controls. These were all the issues still to be negotiated in a period of about 18 to 24 months. Okay, what were the barriers again? Uninformed debate. Many participants had less than a full understanding of the issues. There was spread of mis misinformation by industry. At one of our meetings, DuPont representatives stood up on behalf of part of the US delegation and said, we have done all kinds of research and substitutes for chlorofluorocarbons is just not possible. Okay, and I already alluded to the, the, the ICI's idea that DuPont had hidden alternatives in the wings. There was overemphasis of industry interest groups or regional economic concerns. There was a lack of political will and it's sponsored by the UK, but was sort of prevalent across Europe at that time. It's, there was no thought as yet, it's how to finance the way forward. Confusing technical and sci scientific information was, and it was often conflicting. There was conflict of objectives, production casts, limited production bonds, CFC phase out or just phase down. And again, this overriding issue is a lack of public awareness, just like climate change, okay? So the challenges were framing the debate. How do you overcome these barriers and how do you forge a consensus? How do you determine the credibility of expert opinion? Who do you believe? Do you believe the scientists that are paid by the industry or do you believe the scientists that government issued scientists? You know, this kind of people that have nothing to gain but the truth. And we had a real challenge, the North-South balance. And this meant the North-South balance, this was the collaboration between the developed countries and the developing countries. That time they were known as the Group of Seven Seven. Okay, in charting the way forward, it, the, the diff, one of the outstanding features is defining the, tech, the economic feasibility. How are we gonna fund this? And monitoring the progress against threats remaining and how do we facilitate technology transfer to bring it on board to, you know, to, to preserve the food supply and everything else? How do we increase awareness? How do we create the political, political will? How do we facilitate technology to transfer when there's intellectual property issues that I said before? Joint ventures and opportunities for economic sovereignty encroachment. And of course, there was the funding assistance for the lesser developing countries, which is a real, real challenge, because that was the reason they weren't participating and they were worried. So the turning point was the workshop mechanisms that we used to create agreement on current production levels, anticipated growth rates. That was the Rome meetings in May 1986 I alluded to. The anticipated impacts meetings we had in Washington in June 86, Possible control measures and, me and mechanisms. I introduced a draft protocol in Leesburg in 86. And I think the Leesburg pro workshop was the turning point. I think at that point in time, many decided that parochial self interest was not the key driver be behind Canada, the Nordics, USA at that, that time, New Zealand, and Australia. They were the friends of the protocol, fighting hard to move this forward. The control measures, country problems, and control formulas were discussed, but nothing initially agreed. There were meaningful dialogue, negotiations finally commenced based on a new sense of trust, and that happened after Leesburg. There was again less formal interactions. Toba convened a small group periodically to, to assist him in developing behind the closed doors strategies to meet the challenges. Uh, Bob Watson, myself, Bob Watson is now, now Sir Bob Watson, by the way, Eileen Clausen uh, from USA and a few others. And by the way, Eileen Clausen was a strong environmentalist and disagreed with the, you know, the, her, her senior bureaucrats in government at that time. I was sent by UNEP to Russia and several other countries to provide background on the protocol because they weren't actively engaged. And because of their five-year plan, we were very concerned about it. I had the, the uh, close friend that was Sergei Stepanov. He was head of the Russian delegation during this process. And uh, he, he was, 
what's interesting about him is we have cocktail parties at every one of these meetings and he would come up to me and say, Vic, if I change the subject very dramatically, the person approaching is KGB. There's always one in our delegation. So to, <laughs> to give you a little idea of the background and the, what went on there. So what we did was to meet the challenges, we decided we needed to create panels. So we started off with a science panel, technology panel, an economic and other effects panels. And they were designed to help build consensus. Tolva asked me to create the technology panel. And I spent six weeks in Nairobi along with Per Bakken from Norway and we had then workshops in the Netherlands where we interviewed potential experts to set, sit on that first panel. Remember when the Montreal Protocol was created, it was only a 50% reduction. And I remember coming out of that, the first, when it was concluded, and one of the reporters said to me, Vic, how can you possibly consider this to be a win situation? When you, we, science tells us we got to phase out 100%, and we're only going for 50%. And I said, well, there's an old saying, you gotta get industry up on the rack before you can start tightening the screws. And you tighten the screws by plotting a technical path forward that people can live with. So technology transfer remained a key issue, a sticking point and a potential deal breaker. So we, it was something key we had to, to deal with. So the MP negotiations actually took place over a period of two years and off and on, but the final sequence events where you ended up with a composite negotiating text, which is basically everything you can agree to, but you leave for the politicians to decide on the last little difficulty. It was a, it, the negotiations were difficult. We were up the entire night, if John will probably remember, and we created what was known as a fragile package. All plenipotentiaries were asked by Tolbert to not upset the fragile balance. And what was this fragile balance? It was the back room agreements by a select small group of players. And what did we agree on in the back room? The technology transfer, control mechanisms, trade provisions, flexibility provisions, industrial rationalization, catch up time and guarantees on supply for lesser developed countries, credit for official developing assistance, penalties for late joiners. The treaty said that, you know, if you join the treaty late, then whatever the controls had advanced, you had to come in with those level of controls. Future financial costs for incremental costs for lesser developed countries and consideration for certain countries' five-year plans. This was, and I'll get to this in a minute. And so I'll take a look at the fixes that we actually created in here. We decided that the technical transfer, technology transfer covered in the resolution would address future workshops. We'd hold the in advance approach, meaning we wouldn't take action until we had a chance to resolve these across the board. The, the emissions control fix was to define emissions as consumption. Uh, the theory being a pound not consumed is a pound not emitted. Okay, but remember a pound produced is not necessarily, a, it, the, the, if you restrict it to the producing countries, then you haven't catch, catch the whole game. So we, the control measures took the formula consumption is production plus imports minus exports. And as I alluded to earlier, the basket approach where countries could decide on which chemicals to address. And the weighting factors approach, ODP times tonnage, why I alluded to earlier. And there was an industrial rationalization, rationalization which dealt with, well, when com countries or companies are required to phase out, you've got DuPont across the border in the US and DuPont here. And how does when DuPont's required to reduce, maybe they wanna close down the Canadian plant totally, their plant here, and because it makes more economic efficiency to increase the production on the other side. So we built text into that to cover that point meet industry's requirements. And the, the official development assistance expenditure, it was allowed 20% contribution by bilaterals. And what that means is if countries, if Canada was already doing things to help a country, you know, meet its requirements, then 20% 20, 20 of those contributions could be, can, can count towards their annual contribution to meet their financial requirements. 
the Russian fix, that was recognizing that the legal binding nature of five-year plans at that point in time, that we wouldn't institute things that they, they were unable to change for that five-year period. And then we had to deal with the real clause, which is a bubble under specified conditions, meaning there's, you know, the EU said that, you know, we got to, we're going to have 20 countries at that time. I ended up with 28, but the 20 countries, and we'd like each country to have a vote. And the US said, well, guess what? You know, we got 52 states. We'd like each state to have a vote. <laughs> so it was an interesting, you know, question and answer period that we solved that with some temporary measures. And we said, we had to make trade a driver to join. And so we wrote into the protocol provision that said, if you ratify the protocol, you're unable after a fixed period of time to do business with any country who had not ratified the protocol. And I'll allude to this in a few minutes. This is when in 1990, we had the saving of the ozone layer meeting in uh, London, England and Margaret Thatcher, all right, uh, was, she actually, what was confided in me, so a senior member of the delegation on the UK, that what the UK actually did was they said all of the client com companies for ICI that in Africa, because that was a large client base for them, they would pay two delegates to come, providing one was the environment minister. And the whole idea was that is to convince them to sign on to the protocol so ICI could continue to do business with it. And at that meeting, I was the one that was chairing the technical group that, that increased the stringency and scope of the Montreal Protocol. Okay, and the, again, I alluded to earlier, late joiners get penalized for the according approach, meaning it's closed down, you've got to meet the new controls. And, and the environment, it enter into effect triggers that we created, avoided easy vetoes, okay? Meaning if it's, it had to have two sets in order to go through 11 ratifications and that's that fixed percent I alluded to earlier of production. And to address the LDC, lesser developed country issues, we give them 10 years to allow catch up. And that's recognizing they didn't have to get rid of CFCs as soon as the developing countries because we had access early to the substitutes, they didn't. And we were worried about price and, you know, the companies that produced it charging them a lot more. And the, the, in order to get them to join, we had to agree to this lay. And we had to get a commitment to panel approach and to facilitate updating, updating of the science on a constant basis on the technology on a constant basis. And we created permanent panels. Okay, and at that time too, we were concerned about this non-compliance you know, creative ambiguity as to what constituted non-compliance. And again, at the first meeting of the party, we agreed to discuss financial assistance, okay? Now, what I usually call the covenant with the future was the creation of the multilateral fund. It was a deal struck by a very small working group, the EU, USA the time this time by this time EU has come around so EU USA Canada Nordics went off into a back room and we had what we used to call a four wise men discussions how we are going to deal with this it was essential to holding informal discussion and putting collective heads together to try to design these fixes once agreement could be reached on each point the text was handed over to the lawyers and the two primary ones that I recall was John Allen, who's with us today, and Patrick Sell from the UK. And their job was to turn our back room agreements into appropriate international legal language without altering the substance. At the end of the package that became known as the MP, it, it was presented to plenary session as a fragile balance, Dr. Toba said. Try to change anything and the deal collapses. Very few items were left to ministers to negotiate out. None of the major constituencies, government, scientists, NGOs, and industry totally pleased with the final MP product, which meant we probably struck the right balance. And the, the final product was only a 50% reduction in CFCs. Okay, what did the protocol achieve? 
It produced a process for controlling all ozone layer depleting substances by providing short and long-term plans to address all ODP substances, providing a mandated phase down which stimulated product development for environmentally acceptable substitutes or alternatives, phase down affected market behavior through placing constraints on supply and demand. It signaled producers and users that society's tolerance of these chemicals it will be short-lived. Future investment should be made accordingly. It established a dynamic science and technology driven process whereby the stringency and scope of controls could be adjusted in response to the current understanding of the science, the environmental effects, the technology capability, and the economic considerations. It provided incentives for developing countries to join the protocol early without fear of additional economic hardship for doing so. It provided for trade sanctions and way of denying those that chose to remain non-parties access to the world's most lucrative markets. And it created the world's first multilateral environment agreement, the most successful treaty ever to protect the global atmosphere. Every single country in the UN registered ratified this convention. Okay, and coming back to technology transfer, even after this was signed, it still remained a critical issue. And as I've already alluded to, the London amendments and whatnot, I won't go through that in detail again. Okay, that, uh, yeah. This is a, I, what I've alluded to in the second point there is the, what the conundrum was for the technology transfer. The genesis assessment panels I've alluded to briefly, but it was only 50% reduction, as I said, so we needed to get the evidence base for charting the path forward. My thinking is at time, we're not gonna move to concluding other chemicals unless we can demonstrate we've got a substitute that works just as well. They needed to be, these panels need to be small, workable, transparent, inclusive, accountable, strong but fair, providing impartial and unbiased leadership and communication. The primary membership consideration in these panels had to be specialized expertise, not politicians, but experts in the fields. The geopolitical balance was needed and important to get the process up and running. The technology and economic panels needed to define what was doable at what cost, as this would determine political acceptability of control measures and further tightening down the road. Network and constituencies were also a key consideration. Okay, the genesis of the Montreal the Multilateral Fund, it started during the Vienna Convention, actually in 83, when we had the primary discussions about, you know, how are we gonna help developing countries? At the first meeting of the parties, the decision was taken to establish a working group to establish the modalities of a financial assistance mechanism to help Article 5 countries comply with the protocol. The multilateral fund was a key outcome, along with increase in, in constringency and scope of that meeting in London I alluded to in 1990. The MP was signed in Canada and the multilateral fund located in Montreal due to the Canadian contribution. Okay, the fight for the fund. As of December 1993 approach, concern arose in developed country capitals that assistance for this fund could not or should not be viewed as open-ended, either in terms of fund size or fund longevity. This fund was not to be perpetuity funding, and perhaps it was best to consolidate all major environmental treaty considerations for funding under one rooftop. Fears were that control spending by environment departments could go wild in some countries. The finance departments, especially in developing countries, discussed ways to cap environmental spending. I believe this need to cap or fixing a rooftop issue arising from the creation of multilateral fund was the key, key driver for the creation of global environment facility with its designed in rooftop provisions. Strident efforts were made by some countries at the time of its implementation to move the MLF into the newly created GAEF. A great debate followed and eventually the collective political will, especially for Article 5 countries, which is developing countries, was sufficient to retain the MLF 
as an independent entity. Now, this is interesting. This is a, just a drawing that shows you the important people that came to the signing of the Montreal Protocol. There's John Allen at the back, and here's me at the back here. And you know, a lot of these people I had never seen before. So they it happened, you know, here's Elizabeth May, by the way, at the time, head of the Green Party. And I had not seen a lot of these people before they showed up at the deciding the final meeting. Okay, and I will conclude with this comment. As my colleague in Roma, Roma Boska, who was the unit legal advisor during this process said, those of us who have been fighting for the ozone layer since the early 80s look back in amazement at what was accomplished. And most of us consider our work on ozone layer protection, the most important work of our life. I just want to conclude by thanking my friend, John Allen, who is with us today, and Dr. Alex Chisholm, who I could not locate for the role they played in creating the most successful treaty ever. Every nation state, as I said before on the list, has ratified the MP. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vic. And uh, what a wonderful piece of work. And uh, we're going to, too bad you're, you're not the same age as you were. So you can take this new one on. <laughs> I, I can see it as being altogether a, an immense amount of work. Uh, what we're going to do is let, uh, uh, is go shortly to the comments. I have, I'll have one comment generally uh, as, as moderator, which is, what would you do now if you were trying to actually make a climate change convention go through in the same way? Then we'll go to uh, comments coming from David Doherty, and I have some others coming. Uh, please just indicate in the chat if you have a question, just say, I have a question, or if it's very brief, just say, uh, I have a question on and a line. And we'll do it in order unless there is some uh, significant logical reason to do it in any other. So Vic, over to you. And uh, you, you may want to take the, uh, uh, the uh, screen off so people can talk to each other. Yeah. And what we will do is ask people as they do speak to unmute themselves. And, uh, and also, we'll let you be seen or see other people. Okay. So Vic, over to you. And then Dave comes next. Okay, what was your question again, Ted, do you want? The question is, I'm going to put you in charge as Minister of the uh, Environment right now for Canada. What would you do to get the climate change to happen? Well, I think if problems we face with Montreal Protocol are similar to the climate change. Mm -hmm. I think part of the problem with climate change is the economic repercussions are tremendously more, uh, tremendously higher than the, the potential consequences of the Montreal Protocol in terms of economic disruption. And I think too, that the messaging and climate change, if excuse me, was all wrong. We started off trying to create public will on, on climate change by talking about the Earth's planet increasing it, but without mentioning what were the outcomes of this? You know, increase in the ocean, this, you know, removing the, rice breeding grounds, if you use the term, or growing grounds in many parts of the world because of flooding. You know, the, all the consequences that were, we could have made clear weren't, they're being made clear now, but it, it's slow to retard it, the way in which we need to go forward. And I think the lessons from the Montreal Protocol is you need to engage a lot of these groups, all sectors of society need to be engaged. You need clarity, you need vision, you need strategic groups, you need panels, you need these people, you need to get all constituencies, government, NGOs, you know, industry, all on side and on board. And I think that's what we didn't put enough effort into early enough. And, you know, it's now become more political than scientific. And I think we needed a bigger and harder and better effort to create the political will early. I hope I've answered. So, so how, how do I get to vote for you? <laughs> <laughs> We're over to, to Dave Doherty's question next. Okay. Dave, you're on. Well, thanks, Vic. Uh, very interesting to hear what was going on in the back room. Um, I noted that in 2020, the Arctic o Antarctic ozone hole was one of the biggest on record, 25 million square kilometers almost. 
and uh, the longest lasting in the last 40 years. I was wondering how confident are scientists that the Montreal Protocol, which has essentially eliminated CFCs, will eventually prove sufficient to close the hole and allow ozone levels around the globe, not just on the hole, but there, um, to return to natural levels. Yeah, well, I, unfortunately, Bill Pugsley is not with us here today, but I, if he is, he would be able to answer this as a meteorologist. But the idea is that there's many factors that control the ozone hole. There's a natural depression that occurs every year and result, all right? But the question is, what is depleting the ozone layer, which is the filter, UVB filter? And the chemicals that were up there, they're still degrading. Some of them have a half-life 75 years. So it's gonna be a long time. But the point is there's no further buildup in it. And the size of the hole can be, you know, wind features, the uh, jet stream, a whole bunch of them can determine periodically the dimensions of the hole. But again, I, I'd accede to people with a much more scientific background in meteorology than I have. I do see that Bill Pugsley is there. If Bill wants to jump in on that. I invite Bill to stay. Bill. Uh, I'll try, although uh, I might say that um, the work that uh, Alex Chisholm and um, and Vic did uh, came right after the acid rain agreement with the US, which was a major uh, environmental uh, thing that the US and Canada got together on and succeeded in, in pursuing. Uh, what Vic mentions um, as the lack of consultation with the climate change during the period from about 1980 to 84, when cabinet, Canadian cabinet made a, uh, authorized the first climate uh, Act, Climate Change Act, we had 36 workshops uh, across Canada. The main effort, and I was on the climate application side at the time, leading on things like floods and droughts, uh, but we had up to 600 people in various workshops right across Canada to convince them of the impacts of climate change. The same sort of work that Vic did with developing countries and the ozone layer, we were trying to do in Canada to get a federal provincial agreement at that level in order to push on. And things were looking very good because after the Montreal Protocol and the cabinet agreement on climate change in 1984, which gave us our supercomputer and a research division, uh, we were looking forward to Rio and all that. And it all kind of went sideways in the 90s. Anyhow, um, I might say that I'm not an expert at all in getting back to the, the question posed in the dynamics of the uh, ozone hole. Um, and uh, I think in deference, Vic, you know more about this than I do. It, it has <laughs> to do with the, um, the, the, the amount of uh, gas, gases in the uh, atmosphere and how they are concentrated and how long lasting they are. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, Dave's uh, question about the, the fact that the ozone hole in the Antarctic is bigger than it has ever been uh, and more long lasting uh, makes me think that there may be something has gone awry with the, um, the, uh, the chemical contribution to this, aside from CFCs, in other words. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, have so a, you, Vic, on that. <laughs> I have a comment from Tim Lee, uh, who yeah. asked it right now, too, and then Vic can respond to both because they fit together. Uh, Tim? Are you here? Tim is simply saying in the last couple of years, the meter uh, reports indicate recurrence of CFC minus 11 production in, uh, in China and that may have been a contributing factor as well. Anyway, over to you, Vic. Yeah, I, just, uh, I unmuted Vic, so I, I can ask you a question anyway. You just, yeah. you just heard it. There were some reports, I think, in the last couple of years where uh, there was a Chinese facility that started producing R11 again or something like that. I can't remember. Do you, do you remember anything? No, I don't. Okay, I have two more questions to set up. Art's next, and then Anitra. So Art, uh, you're on. Okay, uh, and in fact, it's very much related to uh, the discussion that was just going on, because my question really is uh, addressing potential, uh, having uh, or a potential necessity for 
MP version two that says there has been cheating that has been going on. There are new chemicals. There was the uh, uh, understanding of the chemical balance and what happens in, in the upper atmosphere was uh, well, much more better known now than it was back uh, in uh, MP1 days. Uh, do, do you see any need for potentially having the the uh, another version of the Montreal Protocol put together? Well, the Montreal Protocol is dynamic. They're constantly, we have technology panels that are still at play right now, constantly assessing it. We have a science panel still in existence. So they're keeping, the idea is to continuously keep updating this and keep, even the control measures are flexible. You can add to it, tighten them up, add new chemicals. That happens routinely. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Good answer. Anyway, thank you. Anitra, you're on next. I, wa I want to thank uh, Vic for a most candid and also excellently done uh, presentation. I, I think both the reality that you brought into it as well as the analysis was truly good. I myself have been through several of these long protocols with UNEP and the United Nations. And I know how difficult it is between the political elements, the legal elements, the scientific elements, the national governance elements, and the internationalists. And the magic of Tolba, of course, used to pull these things off at midnight of the night when it had to be signed because he was so good with the developing countries. But it seems to me that there's a role for somebody who's neutral to do an analysis as you did and then compare them, which have been truly effective in taking some of the poisons and so forth from our earth and which have been less effective and what were the major out of these seven or eight driving forces, so to speak, which were the most important ones in making it effective and not making it effective. And I want, wonder about your opinion on that. Well, that's really hard to comment on. I, I think that it's hard to initiate new international endeavors. There's gotta be a political will, there's gotta be somebody that takes the lead and demonstrates you know, the actual need for it above and beyond existing institutions. And, uh, you know, therein lies the problem because nobody wants to have to contribute more to the UN funding, <laughs> most these industrial countries. And if, if I can just go back, I forgot one backroom story that I think many will find very interesting that I would like to just briefly describe. Toba in, literally suggested Canada host the Montreal Protocol because of our contributions, basically. And when I come back, I, I said, yes, Canada will agree to that. When I got back to Canada, I approached Lorette Goulet, who was in that form, and it was assistant deputy minister. And I said, we've been invited to host the Montreal Protocol. What do you think? And she said, I'll raise it at our ADM, assistant deputy minister's meeting coming up. So but Bill will know this story. So what happened at that meeting is Lorette said, no, sorry, can't do it. Howard Ferguson, which was Bill's boss at the time, I believe said, no, the, the Vienna Convention was a disaster. The Montreal Protocol is not likely gonna succeed. No, he, he said, and besides that, we've got to see the climate change conference due in 1988 and we don't wanna screw things up for it, okay? So I went back to my office and I sat down and my head hung low and I said, oh shit, this is a terrible, terrible mistake. So I go back to the Ret Goulet again and I say a few days later, uh, Kim Leo will know this because we work together. He, I said, Lorette, I think you're making a terrible mistake. She said, Vic, what part of the word no is that you don't understand? <laughs> okay. So I was still, I, I was literally prepared to put my job on the line, which happened the next time I approached her again, about a few days later. I said, I can't help it, but I think we're making a very, very 
very bad, terrible, terrible mistake. And she said, Mick, are you tired of working here? And I said, no, but I really, really think, and I'm asking you, please give some more detailed consideration. Consult with some of my colleagues, talk to Alex Chisholm, talk to John Allen, talk to some of these people, okay? So what the compromise was, she said, I've changed my mind. I discussed it with Tom McMillan, the minister, and we're gonna do it. But here's the thing, we don't have a budget for this thing. And I want you to fund it out of your own divisional budget. Well, my divisional budget was about 150,000 or $200,000. The, the, to put on a conference, I got the job of organizing the conference, finding the establishment where it would be hold, hiring the translators, and it was $75,000 for six country UN translators for the prepared. And no money for the host, the, the activities that are usually associated with it. So a good friend, John Allen here, ended up hosting, having external affairs, host the, the, the hospitality events. We managed to try, managed to talk one of my former colleagues at Environment Canada, who is now vice president of a small company to host in Montreal, another event. And Lorette managed to talk Jack Walsh from DuPont Chemical, you know, to get some pub positive publicity from this to host an event. And that's how it come about. So I'm just saying <laughs> that it was a rocky road and it, that's how it ended up and why. Anyway, carry on with the question, sorry. I'd like to add uh, the moderators <laughs> a bit here. Uh, uh, what can, occurs to me is, have is everybody, even though some countries have backed out of things like IPCC and others, has everybody remained in the Montreal Protocol? And how do we keep them in? Yeah. Everybody remains in the protocol because to not be in the protocol stops you from getting any control, any, any chemical substances. You can't do business with ozone depleting substances if you're not a member of the protocol. Okay, so if you've got them by their wallet, their hearts and minds soon it. follow. Yeah. yeah. Fair and enough. About uh, it is I have two more uh, comments on the list at the moment. One from Dave Doherty who's gonna fill in on the China thing. And then we'll go to, to John, John Legg. And I can take a few more before we have to go. So David, you're on. Yeah, okay. So, um, so you mentioned uh, that there's some possibility China had begun production of R11 again. And uh, I put up a link to a BBC news item from a year or two ago um, that in fact scientists have traced R11 to Northeastern China. Mm -hmm. So is there anything in the protocol that would ask for some kind of sanctions? Uh, can we do that? Well, I, I haven't been engaged personally for at least 10 years with the protocol, so I'm not sure what the mechanisms that currently exist in the protocol are for taking a gap, action against non-compliance. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Okay, because fair I'd enough. have to go through the current protocols, constantly amended, you know? Yeah. It all the time, the meeting of the parties annually. Fair enough. Okay, our next question is from John Legg. John, you're on. Uh, thanks, uh, Ted. Uh, Vic, it, uh, it brings back a lot, of, a lot of memories. The one thing which is a good thing, and that is that uh, at any UN conference, smoking is not allowed. I do remember returning to our hotel room around three or four in the morning, and you feel as though your lungs have been uh, burned be, be, uh, from uh, commuting in Los Angeles. It's uh, really rough. People who smoked were at an advantage because they, they were used to it. Anyway, my question has to do with uh, the working groups. You, you saw that there were sort of natural working groups. And I'm just wondering, uh, perhaps this is putting the cart before the horse. Uh, at, a, at a climate change conference, uh, right now, people seem to, politicians, and let's just take our own uh, as, a, as an example, uh, economic growth is a good thing. 
The problem is that economic growth includes uh, all sorts of demands, that is physical demands on the planet. And including, of course, uh, our expectation that the planet will absorb uh, most of our poisons. So uh, it, it would be tempting to have a sort of a limits to growth uh, working group, but that, that's that been tried. 1972, the first book and so on and so on. Do you, or can you just speculate as to what natural working groups might form around uh, climate change? And of course, I suppose, if all of us had been sitting at the Paris conference, we would have seen what those working groups were. And I imagine there were those, but I, do, I don't know because I haven't studied the Paris conference. Have you, have you given any thought to this type of question or is it really, as I say, you sit down and you start talking and then, and then the issues become clear and then you form the working group. I, I'm just trying to get my head around uh, the structure of the next climate change international conference. What about what about you? Well, I think it's it's a function of the science groups that you have in in the collective agreement and how they function and what the scope of their work is. I'm sure Ted and others will have observations in this, but it, to me that the it's always short term and covered by economics, the consequences economically seems to overrule the long-term consequences on the sustainability of the planet. And therein is a, we focused on that during the phase of the Montreal Protocol. We were talking about what would happen in 75 years, how many millions of more cancer cases there's going to be. And you know, there's three forms of cancer, the squamish, basal, and uh, malignant melanoma. And malignant melanoma, is uh, death, threat, death terminating in 50% of the cases. You know, the squazal and are, uh, are, basal are on the surface and can be surgically removed quite easily. Mm. You know, so, but I think the key is the science and how do you constitute it, what mandate? Others, I'm sure I'll have some comments on this. Are there some politicians we can have surgically removed on the surface? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm gonna actually follow, first I'm gonna thank Vic, and we're going to actually open it up in a couple of minutes, uh, but I do have a couple of comments that might be pertinent. Uh, one is that there are working groups, whether they're in UN or otherwise, uh, and certainly one we've got going right now, or a couple going in the, in the Club of Rome, trying to find ways to substitute uh, anything for economics that will inform regarding the range of values that are important to everybody and to human survival and planetary survival. And uh, with luck, they will be defining other directions. There are many groups doing this, uh, that uh, the idea of simply being captured by one goal, which is to make more big bucks and die rich, is, uh, is pretty easy to take on if we can come up with reasonable alternatives. And the sustainable development goals went a long way to identify a very broad range of indicators that are also important and as important, more important perhaps than money. Now, th therefore my reaction is that yes, money has to be fought. You, you keep talking, people saying, well, can we do it? Is it affordable? Uh, and I keep saying, well, ask different questions. Is it survivable? Uh, is it, you know, don't, don't just talk about how many dollars grandma's worth. It's, uh, it's, it's either a good idea to save grandma or not. And if she's more, it's not, it doesn't come down to how much a pound she can be sold for. Uh, now, the other, uh, the other point that I, I would like to make is that I think it was pro it's probably a lot easier to take on one substance in one industry or one or a limited number of industries than to try to take it all on at once. And I, uh, I, I guess I'd ask one last question to Vic. Uh, how replicable is something that deals with a very vital thing, which is the, the ozone hole and the, and the impact of CHCs? 
is it enlargeable to be replicable regarding the entire survival of the planet at a, at a much broader scale? Well, part of the problem is what I used to call the stovepipe issues within the UN system. When we, in fact, allowed alternatives for CFCs, some of those were global warming chemicals, but they were legitimate substitutes in the context. And it's only with the rent amendments that have come out over the last few years that the Montreal Protocol now takes cognizance and regulates global warming chemicals. Okay, there's a few of them that are now part of that protocol, but they're not ones that destroy the ozone layer. So we need some sort of camaraderie, we need some flexibility to allow, but there's, remember these groups were totally different groups. The group that looks after climate change is totally distinct from the group that looks after ozone, the group that does something else in the context of UN. And you know, the other thing is we've got a security council. Why don't we have within the context of the UN an environmental security council? And every country in the world are the key, the key players, just like the security council there now. Why not bring them together in the context of the UN? And their job is to protect the planet. And that was a very good way to wrap this for us, Vic. I'm going to ask Art to open it all up. Stop recording now and people can now say what they really think. <laughs> <I> <laughs> <laughs>